Okay, good morning uh, everybody and welcome to this one of the last sessions of uh, the 2011 uh, Brisbane Festival of Ideas. And this morning we are uh, lucky to have Danielle Krismani along with her uh, talk, Blogs and Baking, How Can Food Bring a Community Together? Danielle Krismani knows how to mix blogs and uh, baking and to create the recipe for success. On 10 January, when flash flooding hit the Lockyer Valley, Danielle uh, used her blog to rally a battalion of bakers to provide baked relief to those in the hardest hit areas. Danielle is a Brisbane-based blogger and baker, and she has a strong following on her food blog, Digella Emporium, and it was this community that rallied behind her in her latest venture, Baked Relief. Baked Relief started as a response to the severe flooding which devastated parts of Queensland in early 2011. Separated from her boys who were with their mum, whose property was affected by flooding and needing to do something, she came up with the idea to start baking some relief for the state emergency services who were sandbagging around Brisbane. She put the word out about what she was doing on her blog and on Twitter and on Facebook, and offers of help and baking came rushing in. She says that it's just grown beyond imagining since then, and baked relief is now in the hands of hundreds of home cooks and bakers, and is reaching people who are recovering from the floods and cyclone and all of those thousands of volunteers helping them. Can I ask you please to welcome Danielle Krismani. Hello, everybody hear me? Yep. I've got, I'll just get my little assistant to hand some of these out, Liana. Um, they've just got the Twitter hashtags. I don't know if anybody's on Twitter, if you'd like to tweet about some of the people that we're speaking about, that we'll be speaking about today. Okay, so, we're going to kind of, I'm going to kind of tell a story um, of how it evolved and, and what happened during the floods and then what happened afterwards in the recovery and some of the really nice stories that, that, that have come out of the floods. So, this is one of my favourite, um, we got more than 200 media and press clippings during the three months from about 15th of January onwards and this one is my favourite one of all time. So, droughts, floods and bushfires are followed by volunteers. Baked relief has spontaneously erupted in flood affected areas in Queensland to help feed volunteers. Just like it did with the baking of Anzac biscuits for the volunteer troops at Gallipoli. Good to see some good old Australian traditions hit the surface without a Labor Party plan revolution or acronym. And what I love about this press clipping, it, was, it, was, it, it came out of the Toowoomba Chronicle and it was written by a person, not a journalist. And, and that's, that's what we've really found. That even the journalists have become um, really emotional about, about the Bait Relief journey. So I've got a little video for you. First, we talked to Baked Relief founder and BABES member Danielle Kuzmani on the positive effect Baked Relief has had on flood affected families and volunteers. Do you want me to pause that? Baked Relief started just before the flood. Um, it started with just a simple batch of cupcakes down to the SES and then grew to something, you know, much more than I could have ever believed with 1,500, 2,000 people baking. What started out as a simple Twitter hashtag grew rapidly into a baking movement across South East Queensland and indeed the country. Even Danielle was astonished by the speed with which Baked Relief gained support thanks to the power of social media, trending in the top two after just one week. Baked Relief has gone worldwide. Uh, we've got people overseas donating, we've got people in, in Australia helping and donating and then we've got people in Brisbane baking and handing out to people who need it. Oh, thank you, love. While the need for immediate help may have eased across South East Queensland, the focus is now broadened to assist with rebuilding the lives and homes of those affected by Cyclone Yasi. There are many ways babes can continue to help with flood and cyclone recovery efforts. There's still so much to do and we're just at the start of getting people set up um, back in, in the Lockyer Valley and at Ipswich and Goodnight. Baked Relief certainly did that, demonstrating in times of need the simple things in life often bring the most comfort. The favourite Baked Relief goodie of all time has to be chocolate brownies. There's something really comforting that, the, that men, women, old, young really, really love. Now, that's what happened 
um, but this is how it happened. So this is a snapshot of my blog. I started my blog a couple of years ago because my boss told me I couldn't write. Um, since then, she has expressed that she wishes she could write the way that I write. So it was, it was something that I did for my own benefit and I, I wanted, you know, I wanted to capture some aspects of my life that I liked, like design, um, food, funny stories, mostly food, mostly wine and food. <laughs> um, but this, this snapshot of the blog was the day um, of the flooding in the Lockyer Valley, before the flooding, obviously, in the morning. And it goes, um, Carrie and Sex in the City quoted, I'm cheating on fashion with furniture. What about me? Well, I'm cheating on fashion, with furni fashion and furniture with Wellington boots and umbrellas. It's really out of control. There's no way to explain it. A good friend who's been covering the floods on the ground as a news reporter wrote on Facebook, Summer, so far you've been a catastrophic disaster. So that was before the flood in Brisbane. She, she was up in um, Bundaberg on Rockhampton covering the floods there. And, it, you know, little did we know what was going to happen. Now, my children, I had driven up to my mum's the day before on the Sunday afternoon, and we'd driven back in the worst rain I've, I've ever experienced. And I, I, thought we were, I, I thought that we were going to crash the car. The rain was so bad, we, we couldn't stop. Um, it was so heavy. So, um, leading up to that, that point, we just had no idea what was, about, what was about to happen. So, as I said, I love food. These are some of my food memories. Um, my birthday cakes as a child, my children, me, my youngest child at seven months chewing on a, um, on a lamb shank, some of my birthdays. And, you know, birthdays and food memories and baking, it, it always connects to be something that's, that's highly emotive for people. Now, when, I, when we left work, we were evacuated from work, and these are the scenes that you would have seen in shopping centres. So, not a lot of milk left, water gone, people panic buying. You know, I, I saw one guy, he said to his wife, look, let's get some of this spam stuff. They, they ate that in the war. And I was like, this is a war time, but I bought 10 litres of milk and I don't even drink milk. You know, we, we did sort of frantic, like most people did this frantic, this frantic buy. And then we bunkered down. And most people then retreated to the TV, to social media, um, to watch what was unfolding. That's if you weren't being flood affected, obviously. Um, because we were told to stay in our homes and not go out. So then, you know, I started having a look on the blog. My kids were stuck. I knew that they were isolated by that point. And um, I thought, well, you know, what can I do? Well, oh, here we go, here. Um, so I knew that there were people sandbagging. The police had called for people to sandbag. And I'm no exerciser. Like, I will only run if there's a life or death situation. So there was no way I was going down there to sandbag. But I thought, I can bake, and there'll be a lot of people down there. What I didn't realise when I got there with, you know, 24 cupcakes was that the, the number of people that were there and how appreciated it really was. So that motivated me then to write a blog post about it, to tweet about it and to Facebook about it and try and get more and more people involved. At that point, um, two... two other girls, um, Mel Kettle and uh, Kay Lynn, they really w went, yep, yeah, this is a fantastic idea, and they just pushed it out um, through social media. So we had Twitter and Facebook, um, just my own personal Facebook page, and then blogs, so many blogs, blogs, blogs. And, um, and, short, and through Twitter, I met um, a girl, Fleur, who put me in contact with another guy, who then put me in contact with Adrian, who was the founder of FloodAid. And I've got Ben here today to talk about how FloodAid took off, you know, using, um, using social media and the internet as well. So it's a pretty, pretty amazing story. So Ben, would you like to... Um, I think we've got a mic here. Sure. Um, well, Social media. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll be fairly quick. So, basically, if you hadn't seen it already, this is a bit of a snapshot of, of what FloodAid actually looks like. As a website, it's very simple. 
um, and that's kind of the beauty of, of um, the whole project, really. Um, on the Wednesday, uh, when the floods were just starting to come through, which was probably only about two days after um, Danielle's blog post, uh, I got a call from a couple of guys who were working in agencies in the valley, Graham, um, Adam Pemberthy, who runs the Fresh Agency in the valley, and also Adrian, who um, is a bit of a freelance um, design thinker and entrepreneur, and they said, look, we're, we're putting together this website, would you be interested in helping out? Um, so I came in and I had a chat to them, and, and what eventually started as a website to let people know, I guess, where the danger spots were, um, because a lot of the time, you'll remember, um, there was a lot of traffic hitting the Brisbane City Council website, and some of the flood maps were actually unavailable because of the demand for those websites, and you were seeing other uh, people hosting mirrors that actually hacked Brisbane City Council's database, got the flood maps and put them on their own websites and were sending around little links. So we thought, this is obviously a need that people have, um, but what else is there that we can do to sort of take that beyond just a, an awareness of where the danger is and into more of a, an active sort of participation in helping clean up afterwards? Uh, and that's what Flood Aid became. It's a very, very simple concept, um, connecting those in need with those who can help. Um, and that's really the beauty of, of how it's spread to um, where it is now. In the, first, um, in the first week since it was launched, the page had about 15,000 hits, um, which is you know, fairly unheard of. Um, and there are some pretty amazing statistics from um, that project. It, it spread into about 30 different... Um, con no, no, sorry, there were 30 people working on it in the first week and we'd exhausted about 1,500 man hours of work within the first two days. Um, and it, it all started from one tweet. So um, the, the guys that were on the original team basically just tweeted out, can anyone help us putting together a website? We don't have any cash or, or any time, and none of us are web devs, but we know what we need to do. And we had over 500 responses for help, and then 30 people were sort of formed into the original core team. Um, it then spread into about nine different cities across five continents. We had developers working in New York, in Sydney, in Brisbane, in Melbourne, um, in New Zealand. And the categories of work that were being done were, were quite astonishing. The main website was developed in Drupal, um, but we also had applications for Windows Phone, Android, iPhone, and a mobile version of the site in concurrent development in the background as well, because as you're probably aware, the people that were most heavily affected didn't have access to a computer or, um, or power in most cases. So it had to be something that was mobile accessible. Um, at the last time that we measured it, which was towards the middle of Jan uh, sorry, February, um, we had over 1,500 registered users on the website and we'd made over 1,200 connections. So someone who'd posted help, um, there were about 1,200 instances of when that was connected up. Um, one of the most amazing uh, stories that I can remember from that was someone who was a single mother who just had her kids with her, her whole house had been inundated and she just posted up, I need someone to come and help and uh, she had over 57 um, responses just to that one post, which is pretty amazing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm sure you've all got some pretty amazing stories of, of your experience through that time, but um, being involved in this team sort of opened our eyes to really how amazing people's sort of depth of altruism really is um, because there were you know, incredible amounts of um, generosity being put on this site and, and just to see that sort of traffic and help facilitate that was a really amazing experience. But I guess the most powerful thing to take away from it is that it just started from a tweet um, and it sort of highlights what the power of social media really is and it's not so much about um, sharing funny pictures of cats so much as it is looking at things that people really value and being able to create some value that then you can share with others. And um, so people really responded to that and, and got involved for themselves and took ownership over it and took their own direction into it. Flood Aid still doesn't technically exist as an organisation. We're not a non-for-profit non and we're certainly not any kind of um, web development agency now, but we did take a lot of learnings out of it from ourselves. And um, that's probably one of the things that I'd want to highlight is that uh, in any of the work you do, really look for a way in which you can find two mutually interested parties and create some value which they'll both benefit from. Um, it's really about matching people and putting those who you know can do the job in the place where they um, are really most needed. So, 
Thank you. That's pretty much everything. Um, if you've got any other questions, feel free yeah. to just come up afterwards and let me know. But. Yeah. And we'll spend the last 20 minutes here having questions from mm. a few of us. Yeah, yep. great. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, man. That's right. Okay, so, yeah, we've got... Um, we'll come back to this. So, my children are stuck in the Lockyer Valley. Phone reception was patchy, if not at all. Um, and in the weeks leading up to the flood, ironically, I had been introduced to Skype and I set it up on my mum's computer the day before the flood. So that was my only way to contact the children for a few days. So I, I, don't, I can't explain why internet worked and phone didn't, but that's just, that's just what happened. So they um, had no power, no phone, um, but battery in their laptop. So that's how I communicated with my mum and the kids for quite a few days and I, like, I, I don't even know why I took a photo of this but, um, but ironically the, the tweet that's come up on my screen at the time was boarding kennels in Goodna need people with dog trailers to help get out 70 dogs. <laughs> so, you know, I, yeah, that's just, it was amazing, those pets. So, hashtag. So, the bait relief hashtag, as quick as what I'm telling you, this here is how I came up with hashtag. There was no... There was no real thought process that went into it. I, it, just, it, just ha it just happened. It just worked. When I googled um, bait relief exact phrase, there were, there were no um, exact phrase hits on, on Google at that time. And now there's 19,200. So that's blogs, tweets, um, other websites around the world and in Australia and Facebook. Um, then I, I got a lovely surprise when... Um, when we launched the website, baitrelief.org, um, Kaylin, who'd been working um, managing tweet feeds and Facebook and everything with us, she, she sent me a tweet saying, I've got a surprise for you, you know, when you wake up. I'm like, oh, no, please. If this is like 10,000 cupcakes or, you know, some major... Because, we, you know, we, ha we, we had so much support, I thought, oh, I will die. But no, she had launched the blog and, um, or our, our, our website. And we had 5,000 hits in 48 hours just on that site. Um, but then we also had other blogs. So there were, there were people blogging, um, people that I knew and then people that I didn't know that were blogging about, um, about bait relief and what we were doing. So the word very quickly got out um, and they were referencing the hashtag and, the, and our blog. So this is just a little clip about social media. Use it to and track down loved ones. Police can locate trapped residents and governments have kept communities informed. It's also part of the incredible volunteering effort, matching people, places and even ensuring morning tea arrives on time. Danielle Krismani came up with an old tradition to help out in Brisbane's flood crisis. All I wanted to do was just, you know, get some refreshments down to the SES guys. She had all the right ingredients and used a new age method to call for help. I wouldn't have been able to do what I've done without Twitter and Facebook. Her cause, Baked Relief, is an internet sensation, with one of her followers even offering to set up her business. I've got the biggest computer ever. The internet transformed communication during the disaster as thousands of people searched for information. Maybe when your power went out and you didn't have radio and TV anymore, your phone might, if your mobile phone might have still worked and you still could access Twitter or Facebook. Authorities also turned to social media to reach the masses urgently. During the high of the floods, the Queensland Police Service clocked up more than 125 million hits on its posts. It now has more than 150,000 friends on Facebook and 11,000 Twitter followers. I think that this has been a critical part of the overall, overall communication strategy, which has saved lives. But the explosion of the social media has coincided with a flood of misinformation. The decision by an Ipswich City Councillor to put reports of dead bodies into the public arena without any attempt to confirm them with police, frankly, is probably the most irresponsible act by any politician of any political persuasion. Police mythbusters have also pounced on rumours, including dam collapses and road closures. It's been a, a constant fear that we have had to use up uh, resources to follow up on these issues. But police believe the benefits outweigh the risks. And for entrepreneur Danielle Krismani, the importance of social media is rising like a well-cooked muffin. Francine Norton, ABC News, Brisbane.
So one of the girls that you see in that clip with me, Rachel, we're gonna, um, I'm going to tell you her story a little bit later. So, okay, so, we, so all of that's happened. Um, we, we're getting out the word on Facebook and all around the place, and, um, and then we hit the streets. And the, and the day that I hit the streets um, was really confronting, and that was the day that I, that I did meet Rachel, and I went down to, um, to Fairfield. So this photo here, I'll take it from this way. This photo here was at Fairfield. There's some other food bloggers and pe really um, influential people in the food industry in Brisbane um, who just amazing. And um, Sally's house was, was flooded there and, and I came and took some food and they were doing such an amazing job. They, they had a barbecue set up. They w were making sausages and hot dogs and things and feeding them around the street. Like the whole street was being... Um, being fed through their kitchen in in the front of the house. Um, this photo here was out at Sherwood, and and like I, I spent a bit of time out there with a couple of the volunteers that were working on baked relief, and you know the police just rock up, and you know it's just like standing around. It was it was a huge levelling experience for everybody, um, and one of the things that I really loved about it was just everybody helping everybody else. It didn't matter. These kids here, um, they. Their mum sent me some photos and in the early days and they, they'd set up a street of baking and they were running between houses with muffin mixtures and, um, you know, working out which oven was going to be ready on time and then they piled all this stuff in into the back of the car and took it out, like, like all sorts of places, like anywhere, like out, way out to Goodner and, um, and she said it was a really great experience for the kids to have done that. Um, so yeah, there's, she's got a Flickr, some, lots of Flickr photos of what she did. These, these kids here, I found them um, near Sherwood somewhere, like, you know, I, I don't remember too many of the suburbs, and they had drinks and I had lunch packs, which was like a sandwich, some fruit, cakes and things. So I said, okay, look, I'll do you a deal. You give me some drinks and I'll give you some lunch packs. And so, you know, so we swapped that. And, yeah, yeah, you know, that's cool. And I said, yeah, let me take a photo of you. So I did. Um, and this, this gentleman here, John, and we, we're going to see some other photos. He's a photographer in Brisbane. And this was when we were at Sally's house in, on the, the first day that I got out there. And there was just so much mud and there were people moving everywhere, like 20 or 30 people in this house. And he just, in the corner of this, this room, he, he started stringing up um, the string. And he had buckets and he was pulling her photos out and washing them all in buckets and then hanging them up, like just quietly. And I, and I stood back and I watched him and I thought, yeah, okay, those people are shoveling mud, those people are tearing a kitchen out, they're cooking food, but what you're doing here is you're preserving someone's memories. And he, and so I, like I went and I, I started talking to him about it and I said, you know, wow, like this is amazing, like looking through all these photos. And one of the photos had, um, had started... Most photos were fine. Most photos had no markings at all of being through the flood. But some, a couple of the photos, and one particular, um, was oranging on the edges, like the water was coming into the photo. And we're sort of looking at it, and I said, you know what, and you know, between the two of us, we said, this photo now has a memory. It's not, it's not Sally's memory. This photo now has a memory of what it's been through, and it's been through the flood now, and now she's got that that story to tell and it was it was really I, I found that probably the most um, you know comforting time in that time was that there were things to be learnt about what we'd been through and there were there were some good things to have come of this and that was on the first day that I that I headed out there um, so this is Rachel now uh, Rachel looked after Milton, Orkin flower areas. Um, she organised so many people to bake. It was amazing. And she was a trooper. And we set up Drift, um, Drift Restaurant with food and looked after them for a week. Um, she, she really... Um, we did a couple of trips out to Kimira, um, where it was... You know, just so grateful. We, we, when, the day that we turned up to Kamira, this lady came out and she said, "Oh, you're those bake girls. We've seen you on TV. We were wondering when you'd come." You know, so, <laughs> so, so we, we knew then. Yeah, like we can keep getting food out here. This is, this is a good thing. So, this is how I met Rachel. So, Rachel um, sent me. I did a blog post about bar carts that I really wanted a bar cart 
and Rachel found my email and sent me an email um, on the 2nd of January this year. And I, like, I was so impressed. And, um, and I thought, look, anyone that can combine antiques, alcohol, and a good display is going to be my friend. So <laughs> we, we, um, we hit it off pretty quickly. And um, that's just a section of the email that she sent me. Um, there was a lot more about alcohol in that email as well. <laughs> now, that brings me to what we call photography. And Mel Kettle, who's on that list, um, she, did a, she did a tweet about photography the other day and the statistics of how many photos are on the web of food and, and you know, the breakups of meats, vegetables, desserts. Like, it's, like, they've actually done studies into this. But I take a lot of photos of food, thousands of photos of food. I've got probably 2,000 photos on my camera and at least half of them will be photos of, of food and drinks. And I, and I post them to Twitter and Facebook and, and my friends do the same. So this, this um, is a cream bun that we bought in Mullumbimby a couple of weeks ago when we were down for the Byron Bay Blues Fest. And I was like, you know, this reminds me of being a kid. Like, going down to the bakery, buying a cream bun, sultanas in it, eating it. Took a photo of it in a pub. I drank it, I ate it with beer. This, this is a, a duck, and um, I was making a duck curry, but I can't watch, I don't know if you can see it, I, I can't look at the duck's face when I'm pulling it apart, so I always, I always cover the duck's face up. I just, I just do. Um, this is just a biscuit barrel in a coffee shop downstairs from my work. If you, don't, if you have an iPhone and you don't have Instagram, you need to upload that application. It's a free app and it turns, that, that's just a normal photo taken and then put through a filter in Instagram and you can make pretty much anything look good, even people. Um, this is what I call lunching El Desco, so that's just like a little Asian place down, down the road from my work and um, I'll take a photo of it, I don't know. This was a morning tea that we had. The girl, um, one of the girls really loved Tim Tam, so someone bought every Tim Tam imaginable. Um, this is part of my Through the Glass series that I do on my blog. So when I go to a restaurant, I, I like to take photos of the atmosphere through a glass. I don't know, I just came up with that probably after I'd had about 10 glasses. Um, this is a little picnic that I did last year. Um, I'm pretty well known for doing pretty cool picnics. I love picnics. When I got talking about photography with Tracy, the, um, my friend who helped me design this presentation, we were saying that food now is becoming, um, when you go to a restaurant, you almost need to take a glossary of what everything is because it's, it, like, and everybody tries to make everything sound fancy. So I said, okay, what do you think this is? Oven roasted chat potatoes, bovine medallion served in an heirloom tomato and chilli due reduction. It's Chips and sausages, that's, that's what it is, yeah. <laughs> so you can make anything sound fancy. So this is Tracy's story. So Tracy and I were talking about food, we we're talking about menus, and she grew up in, um, in Zimbabwe, and she, I, they must have had some kind of Women's Weekly cookbook over there. It wasn't exactly a Women's Weekly cookbook, but she, she said she remembers having the most amazing birthdays that her grand would throw her, and beautiful cakes, and... And it just, it does, it does remind me of my childhood and picking my birthday cakes. My cousins and I would, would get to choose our birthday cakes every, every birthday. Um, and Victoria, who's, who we're going to hear from soon, she has a very similar memory of being able to choose her cakes. And she's, she has continued that tradition with her children. Um, and her children will continue it with her children. And, that, and they've, they've actually re-released that um, Australian Women's Weekly children's cookbook, if anybody, mine, my first copy that my, was my grandmother's fallen apart, but they've re-released it exactly the same way. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. So we'll hear from Victoria now. Victoria? So Victoria and I met on the side of the road, well, kind of, in a car park. <laughs> um, we met over Twitter, and Victoria said, yeah, I'll come out to the Lockyer Valley in Grantham with you. Yeah, I'll, I'll come and help you. So we pull up. I meet her, she gets in my car, we drive out to the Lockyer Valley, and we're saying on the way, like, I'm in the car with a stranger, and we're driving out to the middle of nowhere, but we wouldn't do this any other time. Like, it was, there, was, there was a crisis, like, you, you do these things. So, um, Victoria's going to talk about her experiences out in Lockyer. Thanks, Danielle. 
Yes, I did meet Danielle in a car park. Um, actually, no, I met you at Graceful. I'd taken Baked Relief out to Graceful and ran into you there and offered to come out to Halliday. Oh, um, I had never been on Twitter before Baked Relief. I found Danielle, I found out about Baked Relief on a blog and then followed it baked during the Brisbane floods and decided that to continue once my kids started back at school during this, in January, I'd help Danielle and go out to Halliden. The first time we were going out to Halliden, I figured if I was going out with baked relief, I needed to cook. So I made, how do I, does this work? I made cupcakes, which I can do, and I took out um, about 80 cupcakes, all in little containers. We put six in a plastic container and we gave them out. And my favourite food memory from that first trip out to Halliden was meeting this lady here is Teresa and her husband, Sean, came in to get... When we went out that first trip, we went to take out these boxes which basically had, were a basics box and that's what Danielle and I were packing that day. We gave Sean his basic box with the wheat bix, the milk, the sugar, cups, plates, a chopping board, knives, and I handed him these cupcakes. And Sean is a big, beefy, burly man. And as I handed him his cupcakes, he got teary. And he looked at me and he goes, these are just like what my wife makes. And they had lost everything in the flood and his wife hadn't, that was three weeks on and his wife hadn't been able to bake since. This is his wife who then came back down later. We stayed in Halliden for a couple of hours that day and that's his wife and she came back in. And we we're having a conversation at that point in time when Danielle took that photo about what baking meant to us. And for me, I feel better when I bake. The world can be turning around upside down and everything can be going on. But if I bake, I feel good. And I was talking to Teresa and she had that same feeling about when you bake, doesn't matter what's happening, you're baking and it feels good. So that afternoon I went home and when we got home to Brisbane, I went and got Teresa everything she needed to start baking again and Danielle took it out two days later. So it was lovely to be able to help someone start baking again. And I've continued with Baked Relief and we'll keep continuing with Baked Relief. I'll hand it back to Thank Danielle. you. Thank you, Victoria. Okay, so we'll have to move a little bit faster here now. Um, this photo was taken in the Lockyer Valley in Hellidan Community Centre and this was when uh, they, the volunteers were watching on the TV what was going to happen. <laughs> okay. Um, we watching what was unfolding with the... See you, Sally. Sally's speaking at the next session. <laughs> um, they were watching what was unfolding in... in um, in the cyclones. And now we're going to hear um, from Sonia who, Sonia came up with the Mud Army t-shirt idea um, after the floods, but Sonia's also a volunteer for the SES and she's a chick and she's my friend, <laughs> <laughs> which I met on Australia Day this year. So this is Sonia's story. Sonia's not Australian. No, Sonia's <laughs> not Australian. As you'll see here by the accent. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, by the time the 10th of January arrived, it had already been a very busy season for the SES. Uh, we officially stop our training break at the beginning of December. Uh, we train every week, and we have a bit of downtime from training over December, January. Unfortunately, that likes to be a very busy time for storms uh, through this great state of Queensland. So we're always on call. Um, and it had been a very wet storm season already with lots of requests for homeowners, just with the amount of rain that we've been having. So, but yeah, I, uh, I sat and watched, saw the media coverage, and I couldn't believe floods through Toowoomba. And my husband was overseas at the time. I picked him up the next morning. I said, you won't believe they had flooding in Toowoomba. It's on a hill. Like, how did they have flooding up there? So, like everybody else, I was glued to the media coverage as they were predicting what was happening with the Brisbane River. And I knew that the disaster management team um, and all of my Brisbane SES colleagues were just going to be flat out. So the best thing I could do was sit and wait and get ready, get all my gear ready, and make sure that when the call uh, came in that they needed more help, um, that we were good to go. 
So we, we're also we're worried about concerns through the Moreton Bay region as well, with North Pine and South Pine rivers out there too. So there was a lot kind of happening, but at that stage, we actually not really a lot we could do. Uh, then as the floodwaters started to recede a wee bit, we got a call to come in and assist in Mogul, Balbari and West End. It was a few of the suburbs that I worked in. Whenever we go into a situation like that, we always go in self-sufficient. Okay, so that means that we had to take as much high energy food and water as we can carry and you are carrying it on your back all day. So you've really got to watch, watch your weight and, and what you've got. Um, and because of the road conditions at the time, uh, we went in, should have been about a 45 minute trip, took us over two hours uh, to get into the suburbs where we were needed. But once we got in there, we went on a door knocking mission. Being in uniform was really great. It meant that we could go in and check on every homeowner, make sure that they were getting the help that they needed. And there were, there were families and friends and strangers everywhere. Um, that did cause quite a bit of traffic chaos, but they were just moving mountains of soaking muddy possessions out onto people's footpaths. At one home where we did turn up, the owners had only just arrived, they'd been away. Uh, so my team of five started stripping out the contents of their house and all of a sudden we had this minibus turn up with all of these volunteers that just said, where do you need us? So together, um, working with them, we had the entire house stripped out in 30 minutes. Uh, and that was kind of what prompted me to, to tease the Today Show later on, that these guys needed uh, their own identity and, and the Mud Army t-shirt was created for them. But while we were working out on the streets, there were these impromptu relief stations that just kind of popped up everywhere um, and people driving past, just handing out food and cold drinks. And it, as Daniel said, it really was levelling because it didn't matter who you were, whether you were in a uniform or not, if you were helping, you got fed. Um, so that was great. It was a very, very physical and emotional work. But I think everybody felt like they were making a difference. And there was this real sort of atmosphere of, yeah, it's bad, but it's stuff, you know, and everybody was just so grateful that they still had one another. Uh, part of my job over those few weeks was also to go into the Lockyer Valley to help search for the people that had gone missing in those floods as well. So uh, one of my memories from that is being part of a search line of 140 people walking through the soaking muddy farmers' fields full of rotting vegetation and, and a few dead animals. Um, but it was one of the most sort of sombre search lines I've ever been in. But at least we could walk out of that saying to uh, friends and family, they're not here, we know where they're not. Um, yeah, so when I could make it, that was my life, sort of for the next couple of weeks, back at home. I've got two children under six that were missing their mum, and I've also got two businesses that kind of needed some attention as well. So being self-employed, and my husband uh, works in our businesses as well, if I stop working and my husband stops working to look after the kids because I can't, we don't earn any money. Um, and it's amazing seeing the stories. You've got to remember bait relief, flood aid, um, and the SES volunteers as well. All of this is voluntary. Nobody's been paid a cent for doing any of this. And a lot of times they've sacrificed income that they would have been earning as well. So on top of all that, uh, we started hearing about the Cyclone Yazi predictions and that weather that was looking really bad. I sat up most of the night watching as that hit, watching any media coverage I could get because I knew that they were going to need help. And I was fortunate to be uh, one of the first wave of the Brisbane SES members to go up to Cairns. And uh, we got deployed into Tully Heads. So that mission was five days away. It was two hours travel time in the morning to get into Tully Heads, mm. full day work, and then two hours travel time back to our accommodation at night. Um, and once again, self-sufficient. Self-sufficient up in Cairns meant army ration packs. So that's what we lived on for a few days. I thank goodness we had the hotel when we got back to get some food. Um, yeah, it was flood damage all over again, but we had the addition of uh, missing walls, damaged roofs, and rain, the rain just didn't stop up there the whole time we were working really. And after I got back, uh, EMQ sent several more waves of SES volunteers um, up to far north Queensland as well. Um, for the SES it doesn't take a natural disaster to find yourself in Orange. Uh, we have weekly training, as I said we get calls during storms, we have stores and paperwork and that to, to sort out, and we also have community events uh, that we help out at as well. Um, but I'm really glad that I had the guts to rock up to this lady at Australia Day and introduce myself and say thanks for bait relief um, because I've inherited a whole new bunch of bait relief friends and uh, I think they've just gone to show that you don't have to worry about going out to try to do something extraordinary just because you're going out there and doing something that in itself is an extraordinary effort. Um, so if you're kicking yourself because you weren't part of this great baking effort when the floods came through, 
Uh, I challenge you to find out which night your local SES group trains during the week and go and rock up with some cupcakes for them next week because they'll love you for it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. Thank you. So, there, uh, up in um, far north Queensland, there was no calm after the storm. When we went to take um, our essentials kits out there, which were in plastic, not cardboard, um, so the rain could fall on them and, and run off, um, we got 50 kits out there, it was flooding. We had about 45 minutes to get in and get out. And the road, there were like, issues with the road and, um, and we knew that the people in Tully Heads were about to be isolated again. So we were able to get them out supplies, we got them camp ovens and, and water and batteries and just, you know, things to keep them going. And they ended up being isolated there again um, with no power and water for another two or three weeks after, the, after that. So that was, um, we'll, we'll hear, it. Um, I've got a story of, of what happened and um, Sonia has met the couple that I met up there as well. So, um, so when, after Yasi, things started to turn around, um, we, we then wanted to bring cheer. We, we then wanted to, to look at not just what that people needed for their houses, but what they needed for their hearts. And so we, we went in, um, I joined with Stacey Sullivan from the Sunny Mummies and we said, what can we do? We can do a day out in Helladon, take some coffee, so take some cupcakes and just have a chance to meet people. Now, Stacey had organised these beautiful packs with like, boutique um, teas and, and cookbooks that were all donated from different companies around Australia and makeup and, and just like really, really beautiful stuff. Um, so we went out there to these people that had nothing and gave them packs and, and talked to them about their experiences. And Vanilla Pod, um, our mascot, came and, and made espressos and they'd never had espressos in Helladon. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, it, was, it was a really good day. It was a really good time. And, and I knew then it was, it was time to bring cheer. Now, this, this story, um, this is in Tully Heads. We'd arrived at this couple's house. Peace works um, in... She started a charity after Cyclone Larry uh, to look after mums, particularly, and families and, and help, them, help them recover. So she was keen to, to, to do whatever she could do to help me. So she made some cakes and we took the essentials kits out. Remembering we only had 45 minutes, we tweeted Anna Bly that we were going and she tweeted back and said, make sure you visit um, Rita and Les. And so, find Rita and Les's house, and we rock up. And they were like, oh, and they, they were so happy to see us. Um, we sat down, she said, I want to make you a cup of tea, and you know, she, she was just so lovely. And her, the, the, the cheer that it brought her, that Anna Bly had sent us to go and see her, um, and Les was just upset that Anna Bly didn't remind us to take beer. That's what he was <laughs> upset about. No, it was, it was like, and they're, they're in their 80s, that couple, and, and aren't living in a small portion of their home because it's been destroyed. So this is Anna Bly's little snapshot. So Anna and I will tweet back and forward. Um, Anna came to a, a fundraising event that we had in April at the Fox Hotel. Um, she rocked up, she was a bit late, and she said, I'm so sorry I'm late, getting my hair cut. And, um, and we had a laugh about it. She stayed for about an hour just chatting with the people out in the Lockyer Valley and some of the volunteers that had done some work on bait relief. And she, was, she just wanted to be there. She, it, it didn't matter to her um, about media or what was going on. She, she did, I believe she did ge genuinely want to hear what was going on. Um, and yeah, she, she still tweet, we still tweet back and forth occasionally. So yeah, that's, it's, it's been really interesting being able to tweet the Premier. Like anybody can tweet, you can tweet the Premier, you can tweet the Premier now to say that you're, you know, that you're hearing about it and she'll tweet back. So John and Kathy Mann, John and Kathy, um, they lost nearly everything out in the Lockyer Valley. Well, they did lose everything in the Lockyer Valley except their lives. Um, and I've, I've got a small clip of what we did with, with them. The Kerry Ann Show contacted me. They wanted to speak to a couple, they wanted to help do something for a couple that, um, that had lost that had lost everything, um, and they, they wanted me to, to find somebody. I asked, uh, straight away, I said, I know exactly the couple you need to help, and this is them. It's Valentine's Day. We wanted to do something very special on the show, so we found a couple who truly deserve 
some TLC. The beautiful life of John and Kathy Mann built together was literally washed away when the Queensland floods raged through their town. In fact, as Emily Jade discovered, it's incredible they even escaped with their lives. <laughs> nation watched in shock and disbelief as the Queensland floods ravished our beautiful state. Countless farms, businesses and homes were destroyed and our hearts ached for those lives that were lost. Look mate, we're alive is the main thing. This is my family here, my wife, two daughters, my two grandsons. We thought we were going to die. Grantham couple, John and Cathy, were very nearly close to joining the list of the dead. We got the little boys, put these little ring floaties on them, and Jess and Andrew were kneeling on the kitchen breakfast bar, and Cathy was standing on a chair, and I was on another chair. And um, before we knew it, it was over the bench. And it happened as quick as I'm saying it. I mean, they just had no idea of the, the speed of this water. And Cathy... It wasn't even 10 minutes. It wouldn't have been within 10 minutes. I mean, it's not far to the cupboard. I know I'm slow walking, but it just happened. Hmm. And I said, don't panic, it'll stop, girls, it'll stop. But she rang Michelle, our daughter in Brisbane, and said, look, tell everyone we love you, but we're going to drown. We don't think we're going to survive. And then we all said the Lord's Prayer. And we said goodbye to the little grandsons and to my daughters and my wife. Along with their daughter and two grandchildren, they were winched to safety from the roof of their home. Little Lockie, the little grandson, just put his arms up to that chappy and he went up. And little Liam and, and I'm, I was just bald, bald and bald because I was so happy that they were alive. I thought, well, at least they're going to live. They were safe. But unfortunately, everything they'd worked hard for was lost. Just standing there and watching all your 36 years of, of your dream home just, just gone. All your possessions just getting washed out the house. Wow. First. To the left was our office. office. Um, that we did have a garden there. Mm, lounge room. We did have cupboards down here. Um, There's just room. nothing left, is there? Yeah. Clothes had gone mouldy, and, and we just had to, to yeah, throw them Yeah, absolutely mould all over them from the mud and the water. Because yeah. they're hanging in the cupboard, and they all had it. But not that we had much, but we had clothes to wear, didn't mm. we? John and Kathy are well known in this area for their generosity, and I think it's now time that we give this loving couple a helping hand. We've got a special treat for you now. If you want to walk out the front with me. Their team at Kerry Ann would like to send you guys for a romantic retreat to Sydney right this very moment for Valentine's Day. <laughs> How about that many? <laughs> and uh, I'm afraid he's been in on it the whole time. He's got a bag packed and we're ready to go. I kept the secret from you. So let's go because you're going to be going in style, staying at the Hilton tonight. And you're even going to have a beautiful dinner. No. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever seen a car quite like it? No. I know this bit. I don't take up that much room. <laughs> so 1800 Hummer have kindly donated this as your ride to the airport. In you go. I've seen smaller ones. What a look. The hum of the champagne Sorry. and a much-deserved, wonderful, yeah, comfy bed in a that. beautiful hotel. Okay, I think we're running out of time. But, um, so I won't be able to finish all of it. But it will all, the rest of it will be, be, up on the, um, will be up on the website. But just quickly, we, um, I was lucky enough to be in Sydney at the same time that John and Cathy were there. And we searched everywhere for a coffee shop. There was nowhere. So we ended up at McDonald's. And I, I was like, oh, I can't believe this. And it was, it was dirty. It was late. It was, it, everything about it was just not me. And, um, but we sat there and we talked to them for ages. And it was like a real, like, Nescafe moment. Like, just sitting there and talking to them over something very simple. Um, yet we had, you know, we had, had shared so much. So, yeah. So I'll just... Um, finish off now. Rachel, we can talk, maybe talk about their stuff. Um, I'll talk about Laura's. Thanks. 
for us here. Okay, so just to finish off my bit, um, we have achieved so much. More than 2,000 people got involved with bait relief during, during the floods and, and after. Um, you know, it was really mainly a women's movement, um, mainly stay-at-home mums, retired people that, um, that really were able to help in, in a way that they hadn't been able to help before. Um, you know, I, I say that they're not just, um, they're not just stay-at-home mums, they're, they're domestic goddesses. They're not the elderly, they're domestic queens and they're not teenagers, they're the domestic princesses of our time and we need to nurture that, we need to nurture the baking, we need to nurture what we remember um, when we were children and the, and the tide is turning and, and I think baking is going to make a real, well it is making a real comeback. Um, you know, we've, we've fed lots of people. You can look on the websites of the stuff that we've done. Um, we've had Australian Women's Weekly just this week donate 500 new cookbooks. Um, we've had some other publishers contact me and donate other books. So they want to get involved in a Cookbooks or Cooks program. And um, Laura, which I met through, um, she sent an email saying that she would appreciate some recipes because she'd lost everything. And... Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to cry when I tell Laura's story, that L Laura and I spoke just before this started, and Laura said she doesn't keep a blog, she doesn't keep a diary, but what she does have, is what she did have were recipes, and that was, that was her history, and I'm really proud now that we're able to help her with her future. Um, we've got her some new cookbooks, and we'll continue to help her with cookbooks, and we'll continue to help her with recipes, because that's what we want to do, and we want to help everybody in that way. So, um, just to close on this bit, um, no matter what your life is full of, you need to surround yourself with people that inspire you. It doesn't matter who those people are. They can even be your children. Um, you know, Tess from Peppermint Magazine, where this image is where this image came from, she wrote, you know, from an outpouring of kindness during the floods, we can take heart and remember that even those who have lost everything have gained one thing, community. So I just want to say, if you want to make a difference to your life, start making a difference to someone else's. We'll take some questions now. We've got um, a young lady here with a microphone. So if you want, like to ask Daniela a question, just raise your hand and the microphone will be brought to you. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I'd just like to say thank you because when I volunteered, all my, um, all my favourite memories was, were around food. I baked some banana muffins and gave it to a lady and she burst into tears yeah. because it was so nice. It's something so simple. And then um, the Salvation Army had barbecues and they had chips and no one won the chips. They were just giving us, they were like putting them in our bags to take these chips because they just knew, we didn't want to take too much because we weren't there to take. Yeah. And they just knew that and they gave us so much stuff. So everything... All, all through the hard times, watching people lose and everything, food gave people happiness and hope. Mm. It's something so simple and thank you. <laughs> oh, no, thank you. It, look, I know sometimes I can, I feel myself not being as emotional as what I was at the start and it's just because you get to the point where you have so much emotion that you have like this emotional overload. But you're right, when we went out to some places and people were crying about a carrot cake or crying that we brought, brought them some apples and some water, like... That's pretty amazing stuff, but it was because someone cared about them and it was the food which brought us together. I mean, we couldn't work, walk in there with nothing, <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it was. Like, it was really... It brought a lot of people hope. Danielle, um, congratulations and thanks Thank very much you. to you and all of the team that, that did this amazing effort. Uh, it's very timely to have this discussion this morning. There's a telethon happening right now uh, for Christchurch yeah. um, today. And I, you mentioned, I think, that part of the team, it might have been Ben that mentioned it, part of the team putting together um, the website or the blog or whatever, that you had some stuff going on in New Zealand. Yeah. Is this an opportunity for us to create a whole global kind of um, community 
of people who get back to that idea that, that you just expressed about doing something for other people? Definitely. I, I took leave from my job. Um, I had an amazing sponsor help me um, for a month and then I took some leave without pay and all of that. In that time, it was really responding to exactly what needed to happen at every, any given time. But going forward, um, I'm working with some people to look at long-term strategy. We did launch in Christchurch. We helped them with media and we, ha we gave them avenues to use in Twitter hashtags and things like that. It's something definitely that I want to do. I want to set up a page on the website that's, you know, how to start your own bait relief. Um, how, how do you do it? And it can be as simple as even if someone has lost a loved one, what other people can do to help them, some simple recipes that they can cook. Like, it's, it's definitely going to happen. It's just, it's been 131 days today since the flood. And, um, and yeah, like, it's a great idea and that's definitely what we want to do, definitely. Thanks. Anybody else? We can probably hear, I can probably hear you. They need the uh, microphone for oh, the recording. Oh, of course. Sorry. <laughs> Yes, I loved hearing your story, so thanks very much. But I just wondered, you were giving away, um, you know, the packs with the wheat bix and all of that sort of thing. Did you have sponsors for, for some of those ingredients and, and that sort of thing? Um, what we did, we, we started fundraising. Um, we just put a, a link on the blog and we, we started fundraising. And generally people in um, South East Queensland donated. Uh, we, gave, we were able to give them a real like something to work towards, which was we knew that we could do those kits for $100. We went to Campbell's Cash and Carry, um, toaster, th there was a lot in those kits, toaster, kettle, chopping board, sharp knives, cutlery, and then what, um, what Victoria said. And $100 could get them, could get a family kit. So once people saw that, that tangible $100 got them that, donations just started flowing in. So however many um, $100 lots we got, we were able to do kits. So we did um, 100 kits. Um, so that was, that was um, and that helped a lot. But as far as corporate sponsorship, no. We didn't have any corporate sponsorship. And something that I focused on and continue to focus on is that it's important to support local business. And yes, we did use Campbell's Cash and Carry, but we used them out of Toowoomba. We waited until the stock was available in Cairns to be able to use um, Big W because they hadn't had stock in their, in their stores for weeks and weeks. But we waited because we wanted the jobs to be, you know, we wanted the casual staff to be there stocking the shelves and stocking the kits and getting them out there. And then we, we used um, some kitchen, a kitchen supply place in Tully. So, Sponsorship, yeah, would have been great, but this was a way that we even built even more community because we had families giving $100 and we were delivering those $100 kits using local suppliers. So that was, that was something that was really important. Any other questions? Well, it's been fascinating and inspiring. I'm from Adelaide and the, the worst thing that nature serves up to us is it gets bloody hot in summer. So. <laughs> <laughs> But to hear these stories has just been remarkable. So, look, can you all thank Danielle Krismani? Thank you. Thanks. It was excellent.